We have a great talk for you. We have a wonderful speaker for you. With me on stage right now is Lindsay Jackson, as you can read. Lindsay is a perfect example of what happens if you attend a big Australian government idea fest and get infected with the tech virus. Because several years later, um, the same government got kicked in the butt by her and, and her companions. Um, so hard that the media used the word clusterfuck to describe it. So please give a very warm welcome for all the way from Australia, Lindsay Jackson, Resisting Algorithms of Mass Destruction. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so, why am I here? Um, I'm going to talk to you about a story that, um, of a campaign that happened in Australia. Um, so this campaign started at the start of the year. Um, 30th of December, actually, was when we kicked it off. And we kicked it off with a, essentially a four-day social hackathon to build a site around an issue that was going on um, in the Australian media and affecting people. Um, that issue, it was, it was quite difficult to figure out exactly what was going on when we started. Um, there was reports that were coming through through social media about people that had been issued with debt notices from the government. They were told that they owed thousands of dollars worth of debt. Um, the first that most people heard of it was through um, being phoned by debt collectors just before Christmas. So they started getting these debt collector calls and, say, and being told that they owed thousands of dollars for a debt from five, six, seven years previously from the government when they were receiving social security benefits. Um, so it was really strange, like where was this coming from? How on earth are people being owed this money, um, being told that they owe this money? And where was the onus of proof that it was actually legitimate? Um, and why were there no organisations that were coming out and saying this is a problem? And who would those organisations be? And that was really part of um, my thinking and part of what got me interested in this campaign in the first place was when it comes to digital rights and what the government is doing um, through, say, tech efficiencies or in this case it was through using algorithms to reduce human oversight within a government department so that they could um, reduce their budget costs or claw back money because governments around the world have got this issue where they are spending more than they're bringing in and our government is no different. Um, so who does that? You know, and, and that's been something that we've been talking about a lot here, is how do we mobilise people? How do we get people to understand these technical issues? How do we get them to care? Um, how do we get them to understand the different levels of complexity when it comes to tech? Um, and that was something that we saw in this campaign as well, is that um, the people behind the campaign, and we'll, we'll talk about the story around that shortly, but as there started to be groundswell and as mainstream media picked it up, we actually watched mainstream media struggle initially to understand these terms, to understand what an algorithm is, to understand how the department could be messing this up in such an awful way, to understand the questions that need to be asked, and then to understand um, the, how to articulate the rights that people have to um, justice within a debt system as well. So it, it, it had all of these different layers. The government's going to use an algorithm. If the, um, the algorithm they used was quite simple and flawed in very simple ways. They should have picked this up, but they didn't because they didn't have the, um, the staffing levels that they needed within the department. IT had been outsourced. Um, so they really, they didn't, have, they didn't have control of this, they didn't have control of the monitoring. Um, and then there was also these legal issues of if you're going to start to remove human oversight, automate these things and do things like issue debts, then how are you going to communicate to people their rights to know whether or not their, their payment is legitimate? 
So I'm really going to share a story today, um, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk you through the campaign and, and how it unfolded. So firstly, why am I here? Um, I'm from Australia, so it, I have come a really long way, um, but I'm also from like this little part of Australia, I'm not even like the good part where everyone is, like where all the IT jobs are. I'm in the country as well, so I don't live in a major city. The town that I'm from is around about 3,600 people, around about the size of a hacker village in the middle of the Netherlands. Um, so this is quite an interesting evolution for me to go from there to here. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk to you about why, like, you know, what was, what was my motivation behind it, behind doing this? Um, my background is in really grassroots community building, community engagement. How are we going to get people participating in communities? Um, I do a lot of living in rural communities, um, and big issues for them are how are we going to get young people to move back to country towns because they're dying out? Um, so that's where I started, and then I evolved into um, sustainable development. So how do we start to mobilise people to look at some of these big global issues around um, renewable energy and climate change, um, but then also different social political issues as well. And then I accidentally fell into technology. Um, and I, the minute I did was my, ah, uh, okay. If we want to be able to connect people, um, replicate ideas, share ideas, create projects, do things at scale and do things at speed, technology plays a major role in this. Um, so I've been fortunate to um, uh, bridge that uh, gap, I guess, between the social and the technical. Um, and I've been building um, websites for government and CRM systems, sorry. I've been building websites for government and not-for-profit organisations for, for nine years. So also really used to working with organisations that feel really uncomfortable with technology. And it's changing. And those organisations are feeling immense pressure to understand data, to be collecting data, to be accountable and measuring. And they don't have the insight that people here have around what is the mess that you can create? What are the dangers? So they don't know these things, yet they are under pressure to, um, to be working with them and responding. So I think there's a huge responsibility that, um, that tech has to not only um, bridge that gap between non-technologists, but there's also a real responsibility to expose non-tech people to tech, because that's where the jobs are going to be. And not only that, if we start to create um, everything, if we, if we create the future around technology in a bubble that is disconnected from wider society, then I think we are already seeing some of the issues in the narrow-mindedness of thinking that occurs. Um, and, and I build in open source. I build in Drupal. Is anyone here building Drupal? Yay, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, so I built in open source software as well. So I, you know, I've, got a, I've got a real love for that. So I'm in a little tiny town about this size in South Australia. Um, it happened that the company I was working for closed down, so at the start of last year. Um, and then I had a baby, and babies are lovely, but they're boring. So I've got a lot of time to think about what I would do. What would I create? If, we wanted, if I want to connect all these things, then what does that look like? Um, and so to... Um, yeah, so that is, sorry, that's why um, I have created this project and, and I'll talk to you about it. Um, I did want to say, firstly, that um, the bugs in Australia are really not as bad as everyone keeps saying. And I understand why you're so scared because, like, you're so scared of wasps that really are scary. Um, so Australia is really a beautiful place and I just wanted to, to put a bit of a plug in there. Um, and I really just also wanted to reflect briefly on the amazingness of this place and what's going on here. Um, and for someone like me that's very much a community optimist that thinks, what would happen if we connect 
people with amazing skills together? And what would happen if we connect those people to people that need those skills or have skills outside of technology? What sort of things could we build? I mean, could we build a village in the middle of the Netherlands? <laughs> um, so I've just been so overwhelmed with, with this and this environment. Um, and it's, it's just been so awe-inspiring. Um, so I really thank everyone for having me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I put the one thing that I've been thinking about um, to kind of lead into the talk is I, I, we think we often think about what we do and how we're going to do it. But one of the great things about technology, and I think where we can be leaders around technology, is to think about the how first. Because if you think about the what first, then that tends to dictate what the client wants or you know, what people are asking for. And that may not necessarily be the best technical implementation. So how are we going to do it first? What are the tools for the job? Who do we need to engage? Who do we want to have using those tools? And then how might we adjust our tool set as we go? Um, and I'm not going to get into the depth of that, but that's something that was very much a part of this campaign. Um, we, we really thought, I really thought about what I was building in, how things might evolve, how to keep it flexible, but also Agile, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not true, um, so that it could be flexible and we could, we could change things around. So if non-techs were not responding to Slack, for example, or um, as you'll see, we added certain features to the website, some of them just didn't work and we just, we just rolled with it. Um, and we built in Drupal, so we could do that because we had that expandability to do it quickly. So thinking about um, how, how would you do it and talking to people from that point of view I, I think is really useful. So leading into, leading into this issue, this is, this is where it starts to build up on social media and we start to see um, a real opportunity to create a campaign to expose what's going on here. So on social media, we start to see because as most of the debts came through just before Christmas. So people, before Christmas, everything shut down. There are no legal services. The Centrelink, the department that is administering this, they've got minimal staffing levels. Everything in Australia shuts down during January. So we're seeing heaps of people um, starting to complain on social media that they've got these debts and they don't understand it. But they're responding to people that are saying they've got them too. That's something that we're seeing. So I'm here watching this thinking, oh, this would be such a good campaign, but I'm just one person in a tiny little village in South Australia and I don't have any connections and I don't have enough network and, you know, what am I, what am I going to do? And then on December 30, we get this headline, <laughs> bludges and imaginary debt. So a bludger is, um, I don't even know what the universal language term for bludger. It is convenient in when for people that are receiving social security benefits to talk down to them because that's convenient politically to say we're wasting money and, and they're no hopers and all of that sort of rhetoric. So bludgers and imaginary debt. What the hell is happening with the latest Centrelink clusterfuck? You know you have a campaign on your hands when the media uses the word clusterfuck. You know it's going to go well on Twitter anyway. Um, and, that, and that's what I I was counting on. So I needed one person with reach. I needed someone that really understood the complexity of um, digital rights, but also algorithms um, that would have the connections and also the, the breadth, political breadth, to be able to spread this message and talk about what it is that I was proposing to do. Um, and I'll tell you that in a moment. And so in Australia, um, we have Asha Wolf. Um, so if people are on Twitter and you're not following her, um, please do, because she's amazing. Um, and she's just, you know, a fierce advocate for digital rights and um, uh, has just such an amazing capacity to understand technology, understand or understand um, the, the impact that this has on, on government and on people. 
Um, and so I set about baiting her to make her get involved in my project. <laughs> um, she tweet Later on that day, she tweeted this, and I said to her, we should build a website. I reckon it would be fun. She doesn't know who I am. Like, I'm just some person from a village in South Australia. <laughs> but she bit, and she said, tell me more. And I said, I'll do it, and I'll do it fast, and it will be flexible, and we can evolve it. But I'm gonna, I'm, I can't do it alone because I don't want to build a website on my own, and I don't want to build something that's not actually going to get anywhere because there's nothing worse than building a website no one visits. Um, and also, she knows the proper algorithm geeks. So she's got the connections to back something and get the right people talking about the right things. We needed people that were talking about the politics, the mathematics, the technology, the legal stuff. Um, so it was, it was um, um, you know, incredibly important. All right, what are you going to do with this website? She's, she's not easy to amuse, by the way. Um, and I said, we may never know the extent of this if people don't collectivise. Who in Australia, which organisations were realistically going to pick this up and, and run with it? Especially on the 30th of December, just before New Year's, leading up to January, where everyone's away in Australia. Um, it's when people go on holidays. Um, they're not bored living in small country towns with little babies. And then, then I got my second person up the top, and that was Amy. And she said, I've got no skills to offer, but, I'll sh but I, aside from proofreading, um, but I'd share the shit out of this. And the proofreading was so useful because that's the content. And so anyone that builds websites, it's all, it's all about the content, but it's also the hardest part of the project to, to come together on. Um, so that became really crucial. And Amy hadn't actually managed a content management system before, and she is now the best content manager that I've ever worked with. Um, so this has created some really fantastic opportunities for her um, to be able to manage a massive, what's turned out to be quite a massive website. So we put together a Google Doc and I had people, um, anyone that was interested, as Ash is sending them to me through social media, through Twitter, um, we start directing them and getting them to write content. So there's really a lot of trust that's going on. If anyone is interested enough to say, I think that topic's important, here's what I can do, we just took them. You know, what was the worst that was going to happen? Let's put it all together. So people were, people were creating content pages on all of the legal organize, aid organisations in Australia. Who could people go to to help? They were editing content. They were collecting articles. Um, we've got over 600 uh, content article news media releases on the website. So people were not only doing things directly with this campaign, they were also doing things externally as well. Um, and I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit into more depth. So it was about enabling a core network to start working together, but also really encouraging other people to do things that they thought were important to contribute to the overall broad conversation. And essentially, that's a movement, right? Like that's that that's how we that's how we create movements. So we end up being the backbone organisation that keeps it together, that keeps it moving, and people ping pong off of us as we as we start going. And so, four days we end up with this with this website. Um, and this is, it's, it's a simple website, um, but right down to the, the banner here, this was designed by an amazing graphic designer. I have no idea who they are. I'll share another one of their uh, posters that they created. Fantastic. They are just interested in this cause because people are interested in injustices that occur within our communities. And if you don't offer ways for them to get involved or ask them to get involved or ask them to um, use a skill that they have or um, something that they really want to do, then how can they be involved? So it is about opening up those opportunities. Um, we did have some tools that were really um, integral to how we set this site up. 
So the first thing was a hashtag, um, and the Not My Debt hashtag became a key focal point for all of the conversation around this on social media, on, on all platforms really, but particularly Twitter. It also helped because um, it allowed us to be able to curate things together so we could monitor and curate. Um, and because we did that and it was so focused and we also really encouraged everyone to use it and to have conversations, we were very active with our retweeting through the official account. Um, so anything that people were talking about that was interesting or relevant, we were liking it, we were retweeting it because it wasn't just our problem to solve. This was a community problem to solve. We didn't understand the depth of it. We didn't understand the reach of it. We didn't understand all of the layers of it. Was this legal? Was this accurate? Was this good policy? Was it bad? We just did not know. But we knew that there were incredibly smart people on Twitter that were going to be figuring this out for us. Um, so the hashtag was, was vitally important. We did build in Drupal because that's just easy for me. Um, fortunately, the Australian government has a Drupal distribution called GovCMS and they use this now for all of their government websites. Um, so it's got some good features, like it can, you, know, you can put it together out of the box quite quickly. It's got some workflow stuff, it's got some security stuff. So it really seemed the perfect tool to use. Um, so, sorry. Don't what? I can't hear. <laughs> okay. Um, and then Slack. So Slack was also another, another tool that we used to enable conversation between um, core people that were involved. Um, and, you know, most of those people were non-techs. Um, they're most of the people that were in the ended up coming into the core organising team. Didn't know any of them. They were just people that, as we came along, they came into it. This occurred over January, so there were a lot of people that got involved early on, and then they went back to work, so they were no longer involved. Um, and then new people came in, so there was this evolution. And because we were using technology and it didn't matter where people were, there was a huge percentage of people that were from rural areas, and a lot of people that were really active were also women, um, So and non-technologists. So this also opened up a way for them to be involved in a really big campaign that was really complex and had lots of different networks and groups. Um, from uh, that they would otherwise not be exposed to because they were women, they were older, they lived in rural communities, um, and it, you know it's just it's just not something that that they get the opportunity to necessarily do. But they were amazing, and the depth of knowledge and the stuff that we produced was just incredible. Um, really, really, really amazing. I mean, I'll talk about that shortly. So. A lot of stuff went on once this started and a lot of stuff that wasn't our stuff because we were just a group of some volunteers that were randomly coming together. Um, but around us, all of these other organisations started to mobilise and all of these different creative people that were, you know, this is just what they do. It's, they're, they're fantastic at it. They see the opportunity. They see the opportunity to connect with something that other people are talking about um, and also to to reach a broader audience because we can, we can bounce off each other. Um, and so this was um, Juice Media created an honest government advert and I think it was something like 5 million views um, at least like last look on Twitter, on Facebook, there, whatever platform, they're on so many different platforms. Um, but amazing, really worth a watch because it's really quite frank and Australian, um, which is refreshing. Um, but I, we don't have audio and yeah, find it yourself. Um, and then we also started to get all of these different things, like people were creating all these different memes and um, different media, digital things, because it was what you could think of to contribute. So we've got someone just started, uh, someone that does a lot of political cartoons or political uh, memes, um, just start sending me these randomly. I have no idea who they are. Um, so Mrs. Madge Smith gets a not my debt letter Fuck Madge, 20,000 pounds. 
Um, and then we've got, a, this is my favourite one. Oh, look, Alice, it's one of them Not My Debt fellows they told us about at the LMP Lodge meeting. Don't ever go near one of them. And then this is Australian kids cleaning the floor of Alan Tudge, who was the minister um, in charge of all this, who was on holidays when the campaign started. I think his, I think his holidays were a little bit disrupted um, because this, this literally came out of nowhere. And then one more. Um, for fuck's sake, Tudge, I didn't travel halfway around the world to discover Australia just for you to destroy it. And I think this is like four of about 30. So at 30 from like one person, let alone all the other memes that people were creating around this. People were also taking this to the streets as well. So this is, this is a little bus stop in a tiny little town in Victoria, over that side. Um, and someone there just started creating all of these posters and putting these posters up on, on social media as well. Um, just, just because they could see how they could contribute to it. In um, January, there started to be protests and protests at uh, Parliament House because as the community was talking about this and as it became such an issue, organisations started to respond around it. Um, so they started and they kind of... They kind of did it loosely in some ways because most of them are still on holidays at this point. Like especially all the managers, they they have January off and then they come back late January. This is happening. This is happening early January onwards. Um, so they really had to respond very rapidly, um, and and they did a good job. Um, there was one group of thirty organisations, um, different social service organisations, and different legal organisations, um, and they came together and. And they had regular uh, meetings and updates on how they were going to respond to the community concern that was being uncovered through this. Um, and so that became very different. That's very different to coming together to berate the government for a bad policy. Instead, this is about saying, we hear, we can hear the, the stories, we can hear people are incredibly upset. Um, this is how we're going to respond to them and this is how we believe the government should respond. So there's almost this air of positivity and constructiveness around this because there's a project going on, there's, there's action and activity going on. These people are not on Twitter. Um, so this filters down to the ground as well. Um, they, but they are very, you know, but the, it, this, is, this is affecting them too. Um, the way that this, the way that this um, uh, um, algorithm or this, this project was, was, the algorithm was focused was that um, the government were triaging how they were rolling this out. So in the first round, they were going after people that, no long, were no longer receiving social security benefits. Um, so, for instance, they were just unemployed for a short period of time and they were unemployed for part of the year and then they transitioned out. Or they might have been students. Um, and so that is why it took people by surprise because they hadn't actually been receiving any of these benefits for up to five, six, seven years. And then they start getting these debt collection notices saying, you owe us money. If you don't believe you owe us money, prove it. Go and get your pay slips from five, six, seven years ago. The onus is on you to prove you don't owe this money. So you can see we're starting to get into the legal implications of this. This, is, this starts to clearly become a government program, an algorithm that has very simple flaws. So two of the flaws that were, very, that, um, that were causing a lot of the problems were Social Security Department, um, were, were changing how they were data matching with the tax office. And they were automating it and there was no human oversight. So this was the computer. So if, if, your, um, if your business name was one thing in one system and another thing in the other system, the computer was matching it as if you had two employers during that time. There was, there was nothing, two employers, you were lying and you now have a debt and, and prove it if you don't owe it. So, so that, was really, that was really one of the big ones. And the other one was data averaging 
over the course of an entire year. So if you were unemployed for three months of the year and you had a legitimate reason to be collecting unemployment benefits during that time, and then you got a job and you went off of it and you were working for that the rest of the nine months, when the algorithm was coming together to calculate the debts, they were taking the total figure for the year and dividing it by 26. So what that did was it um, ostensibly made that three months where you weren't actually working it was calculating it as an average that you were earning income during that period of time. So really simple errors that should have been picked up and that weren't. Um, and you know, that, 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 caused, that caused chaos. Um, so we did some. So we did some things like we did online um, an online rally. So people that couldn't attend a physical rally, we had them tweet either a picture of themselves or a, or a pet that was receiving receiving a debt letter, because a lot of people that were involved and a lot of people that still are involved remain anonymous because they have some level of reliance on these government payments and they don't want to be targeted or have those in jeopardy. So for people that have the ability or, you know, th th I guess that are not going to be impacted negatively, it's so important for them to, to stand up for those people that, um, that, that otherwise um, could be compromised. So anonymity became important, but also kind of content became important. This was content. This meant that we could keep tweeting things and retweeting things. Um, this one's on an angle, apologies, but this is, this is a, a, pers a person with a disability saying the public trustee, so sometimes with a disability there's, or their money is managed um, within, a, within the public trustee, paid my debt without telling me. The debt doesn't exist, not my debt. So this is a person with a disability, the public trustee that manages their money pays this debt that they don't owe without even giving this person with a disability the ability to be able to um, find out if this debt is legitimate or not. So again, there's this continual erosion of rights um, and, and access to, to, um, to, to fair justice and understanding of, of where, where this debt is coming from. Um, Centrelink is broken. So this became um, one of the other things that formed was a collective, a loose collective of, of digital rights activists within Australia. Um, and so they started to um, they they started to kind of bounce ideas off of each other, um, and and that was really fantastic. So this program, where this ended up evolving um, from the individual that that put this together, was to look uh, was to um, uh, ping well, ping the phone systems. Um, from Centrelink, the agency that was entrusted with putting this together. Because one of the problems was, in the line of clusterfucks that caused this problem, was that it was impossible to phone or go into an office to sort this out. They did not have people on the floor that you could go into to sort this out. You had to phone. There are still ongoing issues with people being able to call with waiting list times. Um, so this guy created something, person, baby, um, created something so that, um, so that they could just, you know, once every hour or so, just find Centrelink and see if they could even get through because many, many people just will and still do try continuously all day. People will be on hold for hours at a time just to try to get this sorted. Um, so this was, a, this was another great project that occurred. Um, and then lawyers, really early on, illegal people started to get very involved in this project because they were the ones that people needed to go to to be able to sort out whether or not this was indeed legal. Um, and I'll, I'll read this out because it's a bit hard to read. 
just the highlighted bit. At the most basic level, no entity should be issuing legal demands for money unless they are absolutely certain the money is owed and can be substantiated in this court. It's for the creditor to prove the debt and it's up to the creditor to ensure the alleged debtor receives the repayment demand. It's entirely wrong for Centrelink to put alleged debts in the hands of debt recovery agencies when they're not proved and the debtor never received it. The whole procedure is quite unethical and a complete abuse of legal process. So this comes out in January 7. This is a week after we've started that already lawyers are saying, uh-uh, this, this just is not right. Um, and when you start to look at the government system where all of this data and information is within Centrelink, it's 35 years old. This system is a mess. People were phoning and they were saying, um, they were trying to find out how to update their information or find out where the problems were within the system and they couldn't, people, people that were successful in getting to the bottom of it contacted them multiple times. You could not and you cannot still call through and just have this sorted because it's screen after screen. Um, what we were hearing was that if you didn't ask them to update the right bit in the right space, they wouldn't update everything. So your employer that is accurate or it might be in two or three different points within the system. They might update it in one point, but they don't update it in the other. So people were literally like, they'd get a $5,000 debt and they'd ring and they'd sort it out and it would go down to $3,000. And they'd say, well, how do I owe $3,000? And they'd go through the process again and then they'd owe $800. It was continually changing on them. Um, but legally, you know, legally, what were the issues here? Um, and legal organisations knew that these people would be coming to them. They were already stretched. They were already looking at facing um, massive funding costs in the middle of the year. So they've been, they've been really concerned by this. Having said that, there has been no legal case that has been aris that's arisen through this. So there is, there is no one um, that I am aware of actively looking out for the legal implications of this sort of impact in the digital, in the digital space, at least for this sort of thing. People looked at a class action and that was the first thing that people talked about, let's do a class action. But this is so complicated because there's no consistency with individuals. Every individual has a bit of a different case. Maybe some people did report wrongly for a few months five years ago, or their debt, you know, they've, they, maybe they had this payment for a little while or that payment for a little while. And then the money that could potentially be recouped for $1,200, $2,500, it, you know, it's just not sexy enough to pick that up for, from, a legal organ from a legal point of view. Um, and, and far too complicated as well. So as it stands, there's been no legal action that, that's tested this at all. And again, we, we, have, um, we just have a Prime Minister. The Prime Minister and all of the ministers involved in this just put their heads down and they say, the system is working as designed. This is what we wanted. It is working. Um, and that's the rhetoric they maintain. They do make changes as we go along. They make changes to their computer system, their portal, because they're telling people that they can upload information to prove they don't owe this debt. People are logging in and those pages don't even exist. That functionality within their web portal doesn't even exist, let alone is presented in a way that's usable. Usable to people that have very low technical literacy, um, that are not, that are not, that are just, just regular people and sometimes have real trouble operating computers systems. And then there's no staff once you get to the offices, so there's also no one to help you. So we also have this issue with the 
these technical efficiencies being put on top of people and those people having no capacity or support to be able to navigate those systems and then very little feedback that's going back through the department or back th back through the department to make any of the improvements that, that they need to make. Um, if it's a good idea to be doing that in the first place? Is it a good idea to be removing the level of human oversight to the level that they did? So we just ignore it and politically things move on. Our government has a one seat majority. Eh. Um, Kathy O'Neill's got an amazing, amazing book on weapons of, of math destruction. Um, the human victims of weapons of mass destruction are held to a far higher standard of evidence than the algorithms themselves. And this was 100% what we saw as well. Um, so this is really a living, breathing example of that. Um, you think our algorithm doesn't work? Eh, you prove it. You go get the five years worth of pay slips. You sort this out. Um, incredibly onerous to be putting on people. So by January 18, one of the functions that we had, one of the functions that we had within the website that actually became a really core functionality for this, both in terms of um, both in terms of finding out the the extent of the story, the or the extent of the issue, but also as far as creating social media content that we could share was we created um, a, an anonymous web function so that people could share their stories anonymously on the website. Um, and so this 18th of January, so we're a few weeks into the campaign, we've already got 334 stories, and then we had a field that asked them what the dollar value of that was. So we had over $2 million worth of people that have this concern about the level of, of debt. And this is just who we're reaching on Twitter um, and, and Facebook and, and, other, and, and getting out into the media. So we know at some level this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, We've now got over 500 stories of, on the website. It did slow dramatically because the government did change the way that they were sending out letters and they did slow the system down. They weren't honest about it. Um, it was something that we saw through observation and through a Senate inquiry that ended up occurring. Um, so people start collecting stories and we've got this information and we can, we can tell the story of how it's affecting people. So this one had a $5,000 debt and it turned out they were actually owed $1,500 when they got to the bottom of this. And then we've got our Centrelink is broken sticker just starts appearing in cities around Australia. I don't know who did that. Um, we had a really tragic case of a young man who um, his family attributed um, part of the stress of having a center, one of these debts to, to his um, unfortunate suicide because for a young person to get a $10,000 debt at the start of their life when they're not in stable long-term employment and they've got mental health issues and they start thinking, how the hell do I cope with this? His, his girlfriend was saying, look, this isn't, this isn't real. We've, we see th there's a campaign around this. This is you know, that we, can, we can sort this out, but, you know, it, it, just, it, it wasn't enough for him. This one here, they were forced to leave their job due to illegal discrimination, workplace bullying and a rape threat. Yet, they had to go back and ask for pay slips from five years ago because otherwise, otherwise pay, pay this debt. Um, I'll keep moving because I've had a bit of a, a wind up. Um, and then another one, you know, another comment from a person that was also affected. If it was a psychology study, the ethics would not get passed by the proposal board. Um, so people really, really concerned about, um, about the, the ethics involved as well. Um, so a lot of people have ended up having to go to what we call the AAT, which is the Administration Appeals Tribunal. Um, in order to get money paid back and then the department can still appeal through this. So, the process. The process on how to um, even get to the bottom of this debt is never, is not clear for a very long time and it's still incredibly murky. Ask for a review. What's a review? Ask for an appeal. How do you know if you've actually triggered an appeal? Um, and then what are your rights to be able to go to a tribunal? When you get to that tribunal point, you get 
hundreds of pages of information. So one of the things that we actively encourage people to do was to get freedom of information files to at least get the information that Centrelink had on them. Um, people received hundreds of pages of documents through those freedom of information files and they may or may not have been useful. It was still, even through that mess of paper, it was not clear how this debt was calculated because there was no way of telling people. Um, but, you know, we got hundreds, hundreds of people ended up asking for freedom of information things. They had to put them all together. So there was a disruptive element as people exercised their rights to be able to get that information from, from the government. And here, I'm basically computer illiterate. So using online services in itself has been a big challenge and I don't own a printer. Um, this one, yesterday, they, someone, the, their $8,000 debt was wiped out with no detail. Fixing this is nice, but no transparency and nothing learned. And then down the bottom here, so one of the things that um, started from this was that there was a Senate inquiry that was triggered. So the government in power weren't interested in this. The opposition had some very good members of parliament that were. By no means were they very active, um, very actively coming out of it, especially not from the leader of the opposition. But there was a very quick push to get a Senate inquiry through. And actually that, was, um, that happened in the first couple of weeks of parliament going back for this year. So down the bottom, this person is talking about, this person here says an apology. You know, I didn't get an apology. So we know that person has received a debt. And then we would say to them, we hope you've, you've made a submission to the inquiry. Please do. This is how you do it. We created information so that people knew how to submit to the Senate inquiry. So that's basically a, a, a panel of politicians that review all of the aspects of, of, um, of issues. And so they had, um, we had submissions from, we encouraged people to submit in their own words. It's something that Australians don't necessarily do, is engage in a political, at a political level like that. Um, but individuals start submitting to a Senate inquiry. We give them information on breaking it down, on turning their story they've submitted into a Senate inquiry submission that meets the terms of the reference so of, for the inquiry so that then it can be accepted. And we, we ask people to do it. We ask people to share their stories on their website, on our website. If people, if we saw people on social media or Twitter or Facebook saying, hey, this happened to me, we would say, please share with us. It's anonymous and your story helps. And this person already had their submission underway. This is a great poster. This was another poster that came from our anonymous um, person. Uh, an anonymous uh, graphic designer, and this was around making a submission to, to not my debt, to the, to the sorry, to the Senate inquiry. So we could send this poster out to all of the different social service organisations and say to them, "Hey, give this to give this to people, put this up in your lunchrooms or wherever." And we had a guide um, that we also sent through to them as well. So. That it was a continual push, continually talking to people on social media, continually encouraging them, um, praising people for sharing stories, talking about why it was important. And we got our Senate inquiry and we, there was um, nine locations across Australia um, where these Senate inquiries were held. So again, it happened incredibly quickly um, and lots of opportunities for people to be able to go and talk. And people did, people that had been affected by this um, shared and that became really compelling. We end up having a privacy leak where um, a, a journalist um, wrote a blog about her experience with Centrelink and then the government released personal information about her to the media um, and to a couple of key journalists. So one of the things that does is it starts to erode trust that people can speak openly about this issue without being doxxed by the government. Um, so that becomes really a, a quite, a, quite a serious thing that we then have to respond 
respond our campaign to because we don't want to be putting people at risk. Um, and it was just, it was, you know, it was part of the, the tactics um, that were involved. We put a submission to the inquiry um, and that was the volunteers in Slack coming together. Um, and they took all of the stories, the 500 stories, and they distilled it down into an amazing submission. I put this slide in here because um, what we didn't do was dumb this down. We really had a very broad conversation um, when you're trying to figure out how to break these technical topics down to people in, in, in terms they can understand. Um, we used a, There was a range of different ways of doing that. And it was interesting to see how the media, for example, started explaining algorithms. You know, they didn't do it very well at first. So you'd watch the news and you'd say, oh, that didn't. Um, but slowly over time they got it and they started to ask the right questions. So you could see that evolution occurring. So on one hand it's how do we you know, simplify this down and get this so that people can understand it and then also how do we keep having these really high level discussions around privacy and freedom of information um, and this is welfare rights um, that this was their submission on um, on the, their recommendations because different organisations start putting recommendations through. So we tweet that stuff. There are people that are incredibly interested in that sort of thing. Um, we did try to freedom of information the protocol and that, in, that came to be very difficult. Um, and, and there were continual delay tactics and we kind of got something that's a bit not helpful. Um, so also dealing, dealing with government departments on that as well. Um, now this is, sorry, this is actually really hard to read, but this says, so far over 72% of the debts raised had a recovery fee applied and there was questions about whether or not that was illegal. There was a 10% recovery fee um, added to it straight away. Um, and of the 220,000 assessments initiated so far, 82,000 or 37 per cent are still in kind of limbo with no debt raised. And of the assessments that, um, that JP ended up doing, 23.6 um, per cent resulted in people not owing any money so far. So this continual rate of a 20 per cent error rate that we were aware of continues to happen. And we know people paid these debts because they did not want to deal with the government. Um, that, was, that was very clear. Um, and of those, 9.95% ended up owing nothing. And still, it's really hard to kind of get these figures because you've got to go through all these Senate inquiry processes and asking the department for information, and they don't even have the capacity to run reports on this. Uh, really quite appalling. But there's also this positive campaign that we're running, and that this is the power of people to pull together um, and to be supporting each other and collaborating, and this feeling that working together we can actually solve this. And supporting people to submit to the Senate inquiry and to go and speak at a Senate inquiry when they've never actually d um, done anything like that before. And people that did it responded really positively. So these are people that are just on Twitter thanking Every, you know, people just started to get involved with the conversation. Um, and early and far-reaching awareness raised it and emboldened a great many to challenge it. Um, and that was fantastic. And we did have some wins. Um, so we won, um, there was um, the OAIC, which is the Office of the Information Commissioner, um, it was, um, has started an audit into the program and then within the Australian Public Service there's also um, privacy impact assessments that are, that are underway as well. So there, does, there, was, there, there continue to be wins in changes in behaviour in how the department is, is, is working. And just on that as well, what sort of has happened is the, um, the connectivity or the, uh, the connectivity between um, the managers at the top level of this department and the people on the ground and the people that are doing the work, there's absolute disconnection there. These people are totally disenfranchised when it comes to having pushback on these policies that they are being asked to find ways to implement. So these pe people are doing what they're told. They know these 
these algorithms are ridiculous and they're going to cause these errors, but it's their job and they've been told to do it. So the other thing that the people power starts doing is it gives a voice that people within the department themselves don't have. So once, it's, once you get a voice from outside, then that starts to be listened to in a, in a much stronger way than people that are working for the department that are complaining about the work that they're doing. So, starting to... Have we learned anything from this? Um, it's still going and it is still being rolled out to other uh, sectors within the community. Um, and it, it's, in, it's incredibly disappointing and it's tough because um, there is no real ability to get these sorts of grassroots movements funded in any way. Um, and we can see that some funding, even small amounts, would have actually gone a long way to increasing the capacity of what we were able to do. So, you know, a, a couple of thousand dollars would have allowed us to be able to produce print material to people on the ground, or it would have been able to, to um, let us produce videos in other languages for people that were also affected by this. You know, we're not touching, we're not even touching the edge of people from non-English speaking backgrounds. Um, um, the, or other, other groups uh, that are also affected by this. So in Australia, as far as digital rights go and as far as where we are within a global community and what, ha what happens in one country, how that may impact on other countries, um, we're still pushing ahead with, this, with, with the Not My Debt stuff. Um, and we also have a war on mathematics at the moment. So we, our government is um, wanting, to, um, we, wanting to look at de-encryption. Um, they're wanting to have access to, to de-encrypted data. And this is a quote from our, from our Prime Minister, that the laws of mathematics are very commendable, but the only laws that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. So, you know, this is, this is, this is where we're at. This is, this is exactly what we're dealing with. So this is from a couple of weeks ago. Then a couple of days ago, we've got people that are within this, within Centrelink. They're now getting these letters. With, this is the Australian Federal Police logo on it. Um, this actually, the template for this started coming out early in the campaign and we were kind of sceptical about whether or not it was real. It's real. People are getting these letters. At the bottom of the letter, in red, it says, please dob someone in if you know that they're doing the wrong thing. And then last night, we get this one here. And I'll read this out. The Turnbull government will today seek to impose restrictions on public servants criticising the coalition, the government, on social media, warning that employees risk disciplinary action for liking anti-government posts or privately emailing negative material to a friend from home. Documents obtained show that they would also be warned they could be in breach of the Public Service Code of Conduct if they do not remove nasty comments about the government posted by others on the employee's Facebook page. So we are now monitoring the social media of people working within the public service. So who is that? Nurses? Police? People working within departments? Potential whistleblowers? If you're spotted liking something, you know, this is all this effort, all this work, and yet there is still this continual need to be, to be doing more and to be educating people. The government's problem in this case, we hope, longevity-wise, is that so many people have gotten these debt letters and so many people have been annoyed by them or know someone that's got one, that when they go to vote, this will be an issue that does arise again. Um, but I'm sure from the government's point of view, they're just hoping that it goes away and everyone will have forgotten about it. And, and time will tell and we'll have to see that. So just to close, I'll just close with a, another quote from, from, um, from Cathy. If we back away from them and treat mathematical models as a neutral and inevitable force, like the weather or the tides, we abdicate our responsibility. Um, oh, last one. Last one from Asha. 
is that one positive, one strong positive was that this campaign so far has led to $18 million in false debts being revoked in New South Wales alone. So one state in, South, in Australia. Um, so this has had impact in real terms, in terms that can be measured. Um, and it's, it's been something that, that has actually really helped people. Thank you for having me. Stay with me, oh, stay with me. <laughs> Enjoy your applause. Uh, well deserved. Thank you very much. We still have two minutes for Q&A, so if you have any questions, please line up at the microphones. Otherwise, I will ask one question. Who explained uh, to the media the algorithms? Did they do their work and actually uh, did um, research, or, or did they call you or the, the, the organization? We really stayed quite low, um, and like especially me. Um, we, we were kind of the behind the scenes people. People really came up to talk about this. And that was the other great thing. Like it was incredibly smart people that understood this, that, that stood up and responded. Um, and and um, it actually led to quite a lot of information about what had been happening in the public service coming out, um, at particularly at a digital level. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we definitely left that to people that knew what they were talking about. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, all th so uh, technology is a multiplier, right? It, it, it projects force and, and multiplies it. Now, the government has more computers and algorithms to, do, to fuck things up, and you have, like, you know, the computers and the internets to counter them. Now, all things considered, do you still do you think there's some equality of arms, and is it getting worse or better if you take a line from the '60s civil unrest mm. and, and community quick, protest to qu now? Quick answer. Please. Yeah. The organizations that could be doing that work do not have the technical capacity to know how to do this. This is not complicated. This is simple technology used well um, and, and, and delivered well and delivered cheaply. But the organizations that might be able to do this and to counter that government, they don't know how to computer. Um, again, it's why it's so important that organizations and, and you know, people that come to these sorts of things can find ways to connect with non-techs and providers provide that expertise. Um, yeah. Think Lindsay, thank you very much. I'm very sorry we're out of time. I'll Lindsay is here. Uh, <laughs> and like hopefully she will come back. Lindsay, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.